This is the first time I've ever been interviewed by a former student, I believe. Well, this is the first time I've ever had a former professor on my podcast. So I'm very excited about this. You know what I remember? I remember you walking with me after class back to the Back to I, the house. I, I love that. I really yeah. did. It was so sweet. And I said to myself, this is the way pedagogy should be, you know? Henry Louis Gates Jr. is one of the most influential scholars of Black history and literature in the United States. He's the director of the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, author of more than 20 books and creator of more than 20 documentaries, host of the groundbreaking genealogy series, Finding Your Roots, and, as you just heard, my former professor. But he's also really America's professor, and his work is foundational to how Americans understand race as part of our shared national story. He's won an Emmy Award, a Peabody Award, and an NAACP Image Award, all for his documentary series, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. And now he has a new book, The Black Box, Writing the Race. It's a literary history of how we understand race in America and tells the story of Black self-definition through writers, from Phyllis Wheatley to Frederick Douglass to James Baldwin, who have used literature to build Black identity in the face of racist oppression. Throughout our conversation, I was reminded of how Professor Gates really is always looking for that teachable moment. He opened up about what it was like to grow up in West Virginia in the early years of school desegregation, why Finding Your Roots became the show it is today, and how his genealogical research has taught him that all of us are more alike than we are different. I'm Charlotte Alter, Senior Correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. So, Professor, you grew up in Piedmont, West Virginia. You were born in the early 1950s. How did growing up in this place at this time influence you? Well, Piedmont, West Virginia is an Irish-Italian paper mill town located on the Potomac River in the Allegheny Mountains, halfway between Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C. And a lot of people from D.C. and Baltimore area come up there and own homes there. I was born in 1950 when there were 2,500 people, if I'm remembering correctly, and about 350 or so were black. And in 1955, a year after Brown v. Board, the good citizens of Mineral County, West Virginia, voted to integrate the schools with no Rosa Parks, with no Martin Luther King. Wow. So I started school on the last day of August, 1956, in what we called the white school, And I went to an integrated school for 12 years. And I was treated like a little prince. So listen, a lot of other Black kids who were, you know, among the first to go to these integrated schools had a very different experience, a very negative experience, you know, where they faced a lot of hostility. Why do you think your experience was like this? Two reasons. My brother, Paul, is five years older, and he had been in the white school a year before I started school. Okay. And he's brilliant. And he was just knocking it out of the park. So they knew that I was from a smart family. But even more important was everybody in that town knew everybody else. Hmm. And my parents were widely, deeply respected. My mother was very active in the PTA. As soon as that school integrated, she was there. And in 1957, in second grade, she was elected the first colored secretary of the Piedmont PTA. Wow. (laughs) And that was like a moment in civil rights history in Piedmont, West Virginia, you know. And all the Black people in town, mostly the women, would, on the evening of the PTA meeting, they would all get dressed up. And they would go over to the high school just to watch my mother read the minutes. (laughs) Wow. You see, my father worked two jobs. And he worked in the paper mill in the day, West Vaco. And then he was a janitor at the telephone company. And then he'd be home at 7.30. And he did that for the extra income. And he did that so that my mother wouldn't have to work. Because that was the goal for a middle-class man and certainly... That was true in the white community. It was perhaps even truer in the African-American 
community. So we were in the upper class, as it were, as ironic as that might sound, among the working class white and black kids in my school. But the final thing I want to say, so as not to um, make the people in Piedmont sound superficial, is that they had a deep sense of character and fairness and an even playing field. They thought if you worked hard and you deferred gratification, you saved your money, you comported yourself in a dignified way, then you were entitled to a certain status in the community. These were mostly, I would say, second-generation Italian and Irish immigrants who had come there at the turn of the century to work at the mill. And the Black people, most of them, had migrated from Virginia also to work at the paper mill. But look, there were racist strictures. We couldn't sit down in the local hangout called the cut rate. The white kids could sit down. We had to order at the counter. We got our food in, you know, take away plastic cups and paper plates and and it drove us nuts. Wow. And we couldn't date white girls. That was a big thing that we were told the black girls couldn't date white boys and the black boys couldn't date white girls. So what that meant <laughs> when you hit puberty is that all the white girls thought about black boys and all the black boys thought about <laughs> white girls. <laughs> so you were really growing up in the midst of some of the most consequential moments of the civil rights movement. How much did you know that you were growing up at this really pivotal moment for Black Americans? Keenly aware. We got Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. And when Emmett Till was beaten and John Johnson chose to put his deformed body on the cover, um, we looked at that. And I mean, we were shown that and we talked about that. The news at that time only lasted 15 minutes. That was the evening news. But we watched it as a family together. Mm -hmm. And so 1957, when I was seven, Central High School, Little Rock. And my parents were Republicans until JFK. And I remember them being so proud of Eisenhower for sending troops to Little Rock to integrate Central High School. And names like Arthurine Lucy, who integrated the University of mm -hmm. Alabama. And then by the time JFK's elected, I remember, like it was yesterday, the four of us gathering around the television set, the civil rights movement was unfolding like a panorama wow. right outside our, our house or outside virtually, mm -hmm. you know? And so we talked about it all the time. And then, of course, when JFK was killed, that was just horrible for uh, us as Black people and us as citizens of Mineral County. I mean, everybody loved JFK. And then by the time my senior year, April 4th, 1968, when Dr. King was so brutally murdered, I remember my uh, three best buddies who were Black coming to our house and watching every second of the coverage. And so we boycotted classes and we all got in, into trouble. But we talked about civil rights all the time because I was reading Ebony Magazine and there would be book reviews like of the autobiography of Malcolm X mm -hmm. or Man, Child and the Promised Land or J any of James Baldwin's work. And I would order these books through the Book Club of America. And I would get them, I would read them, my dad would read them, and then my buddies would read them because wow. these were not in our, our school library by and large. You know, a lot of people who watched the civil rights movement unfold as you did and wanted to participate in this new world that was being born, they became lawyers or they became advocates or activists or journalists or politicians. Why did you decide on academia as sort of your path forward? Well, I was raised to be a doctor. Hmm. Pauline Augusta Coleman Gates was going to be the mother of two doctors. And that's the way it was. For my birthday and Christmas, I get dissecting kits, stethoscopes, you know, whatever. Right. <laughs> and when I was at Yale, I majored in history. And then I got a fellowship to go to the University of Cambridge. And I met two people who changed my life. I wanted to take a course in African mythology. And I asked one of the English professors and they said, oh, there's a Nigerian playwright here in exile from Nigeria. 
Hmm. Why don't you go see him? And I did. And his name was Wally Shoyinka. And that was 1973. 13 years later, he became the first African to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Mm -hmm. But Cambridge English Department was so conservative that they wouldn't give him an appointment. His appointment was in social anthropology because they said African literature is not really literature. So I studied with him through the social anthropology department. Can you imagine being in tutorials with a guy who 13 years later is going to get the Nobel Prize? It was like dying and going to heaven. And the other person I met at the same time was Anthony Appiah. And you know who he is, Kwame Anthony Appiah. This is the brilliant philosopher, professor at NYU. Right. And who writes the ethicist column in the Sunday Times uh, magazine each week. And so they took me to dinner. It was in October of 73. And Shoyink is an enophile. So we were drinking bottles of wine. And I'd never even drunk a lot of wine before. So I'm getting smashed and (laughs) Shoyinka pounds on the table and says, right, we brought you here for a reason. We're here from your future. We are visiting you from your future. You are not going to be a medical doctor. That's the stupidest thing we ever heard of. You were put on earth to be a professor of African and African-American studies. You're going to get a PhD here. And I had not even dreamed about getting a PhD. And you ended up being the first African-American to get a PhD in English literature from Cambridge, right? Yeah, the first to get a PhD in English literature. There was one other Black person who got a PhD. I think it was in mechanical engineering, and he taught down the road here at at MIT. But Charlie, you know what? I started to cry. Wow. Because they had named something that I really wanted and couldn't even name myself. So I realized at Cambridge that that's what I really wanted to do. Then I became terrified that I would never be able to pull it off. So clearly it worked out because in 1991, you were hired by Harvard as chair of the African-American Studies Department and W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of the Humanities. And then many years after that, I took your Introduction to African-American Studies class at Harvard, an absolutely famous class. I was in your class in the fall of 2008 when Barack Obama was elected as the first Black president of the United States. Since then, so much has happened. Black Lives Matter, Trump's election, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. How do you incorporate some of these more current events into the study of Black history? Well, you remember that the class was structured around debates. Yeah, debates that Black people had had in the tradition. So starting with Barack, there were a lot of Black thinkers who said, Obama's election represented the end of race, which Mm -hmm. is the end of races, which is totally ridiculous. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I thought it was ridiculous even then. So we have a Black man in the White House, beautiful Black family. All of the world can see that we are intelligent and poised and composed and full of class. Is this the end of race or not? So that's one debate. Reparations. We didn't deal with reparations. Maybe we touched on it 15 years ago, but people want to talk about that now. Yeah. Abolish the police, which I think is a totally stupid idea, but that was a hot idea, a hot topic right after George Floyd. I'm curious about that. Why, why do you think that's a stupid idea? And how do your students react when you say that? I want to abolish bad policemen. I want to abolish bad policing. I want to abolish the fear that so many Black people feel in the presence of the police. I want more harmonious relationships between the community and law enforcement officers. And I say that as a person who was arrested. Right. (laughs) You were famously arrested for trying to get into your own house. Right. And so, no, we need the police force, but we need a police force that is not racist and is not brutalizing people. You know, one of the secrets to the way I view the world, Charlotte, is that I grew up in a working class white America. And the poor white people were afraid of the police, too. (laughs) All I'm saying is that I think that class matters in, uh, to paraphrase Cornell West, I think that economic relationships are of fundamental importance to um, how behavior manifests itself in a society along, quote unquote, racial lines. When we come back, Henry Louis Gates Jr. digs into his hit series, Finding Your Roots, and his new book, The Black Box, Writing the Race. 
More in a moment. I have to ask you about Finding Your Roots, which is such an interesting show. And you've always had this kind of curiosity about genealogy. I'm curious, are you finding that learning about their own genealogies helps people see themselves in American history? Um, That's a great question. Learning about your family history, learning that you had an ancestor say, who served in the Civil War or the War of 1812 or the American Revolution or World War I, allows you to insert yourself into American history directly in a way that you couldn't imagine before. Hmm. I always ask people, did you know you had an ancestor who fought for the Union? Or did you know you had an ancestor who fought with George Washington? And if you had known that, would that have changed your attention span when you took American history in the eighth grade, they go, absolutely. They would have been all over it. And heretofore, they felt that it was just boring, you know, a bunch of facts about people who had nothing to do with them. When I started Charlotte, actually, I only did black people. It was called African-American Lives. African-American Lives 1, then African-American Lives 2. And I got a letter from a Jewish lady. said, Dear Professor Gates, I've always admired your stances on cultural pluralism and diversity. But after watching two seasons of African-American lives, I've decided you're big, fat racist (laughs) because you don't do white people. (laughs) How about Jewish people like me? And you know what? It had never occurred to me. My whole brand was blackness, right? Hmm. And my motivation for doing Finding Your Roots was directly from Alex Haley's roots. And I wanted to do what Alex Haley purported to have done, but I wanted to do it scientifically, roots in a test tube roots in a laboratory using DNA as well as uh, genealogy. So my first supposition was that only African-Americans were ignorant of their ancestors. This is going to sound ridiculous, and I know it is now, but I thought all white people had a big family crest hanging over their mantelpiece, right? (laughs) And to my amazement, when I allowed myself to take that lady's letter seriously. And I hope she's listening to your podcast because I've lost the letter and I've always wanted to give that lady a hug because she changed my life. Hmm. I then decided that I would try doing everybody's roots. Often I find that the people most interested in genealogy are middle age, maybe 50 plus. Let me generalize and say 50 plus. Why is that important? It's important because at that age, you're experiencing senses of alienation, loss, grief, You know, your parents probably are gone. Sometimes your friends are gone. Family members are gone. Genealogy allows you to find two sets of ancestors, new family members in the past, and through the wonders of DNA analysis called DNA cousins, new relatives in the present. Wow. So that precisely when your family is shrinking, Hmm. you can expand your sense of family back in time, vertically and horizontally. So your new book, which is called The Black Box, Writing the Race. In the introduction of the book, you talk about the birth of your granddaughter, Ellie, and you talk Mm. about asking your son-in-law, who's white, if he checked the black box for her. And so can you tell me why that story was so important to you? Well, to my amazement, when I started doing Finding Your Roots, I was, I am the most DNA analyzed black man in the history of the world, right? (laughs) And they revealed all this stuff an episode of Finding Your Roots. And one of the shocks was that I am 49% white and 49% black. Now, my father looked white. He could have passed. My grandfather was so white, we called him Casper behind his back. Wow. (laughs) And we knew that my great-great-grandfather was a white man. I know from my DNA that he was of Irish descent. So I'm half white and half black. Well, the mother of my children is 100% white. So that means my daughters were 75% white, right? Then my older daughter, Maggie, married a guy who's 100% white. So that means their daughter is 87.5% white. And she looks just like a little white girl. 
And there's no way that anybody would know that I am her grandfather. But for reasons that I can't really explain, I felt that it was important that she be identified as an African-American because she comes from a long line of what used to be called mulattoes, a long line of Gateses who could pass. I'm very proud of my mixed race heritage. I'm very proud of African and African-American culture. I raised my mixed race daughters. I socialized them. My wife and I did to be both mixed race, but to be proud of their black heritage and to, to plant their feet firmly on a foundation of African and African-American culture. And I wanted that for Ellie too. Yeah. So what do you specifically want Black Americans to take away from this book? Well, I want all my readers to take away the fact that race is a social construction. Hmm. That's why I called it the Black Box. Right. And that's why I start the book with that anecdote in order to put under scrutiny the whole concept of race, the ridiculousness of it, the complexity, the wonders of it. All those things are true at the arbitrariness of it. Right. I think that the reason that Finding Your Roots is so incredibly popular, thank God, uh, is because we have two subliminal messages. One is that America is a nation of immigrants. You know, everybody came here on a boat, except our Native American sisters and brothers who walked across the Bering Strait 15,000 years ago. My Black ancestors didn't come here willingly. They didn't come on the Mayflower, but they came here from elsewhere. So we're all from elsewhere. It's a nation of immigrants, and that's what makes us great. And the second takeaway is that under the skin, at the level of the genome, we are all almost virtually identical. We are 99.99% the same. And those are messages that in these fraught times in our country, Mm -hmm. we need to repeat to ourselves over and over again every day. So I want to talk a little more about this idea of checking a box as it relates Mm -hmm. to race, because that is sort of in in a lot of ways what your book is interrogating and expanding on. Um, Well, Well, okay, what box did you check for your little girl? You know what? It's a great question. We struck a grand bargain when we decided to have kids, which is that our daughter is going to have uh, only my husband's last name, which is an Italian last name, and only my religion. So she will be Jewish Italian, but not uh-huh. half Catholic, half Jewish. But it's really funny that you asked this because this gets to the question of the box. It was very important to me that if somebody said to Rosie, what's your religion? She says, I'm Jewish. Right. She doesn't say, I'm half Jewish and half Catholic. She says, I'm Jewish. If somebody right. says, oh, Rosie Chisano, are you Italian? She says, yeah. yeah. So she has a multiple identity. So the other takeaway from the black box is that we all have multiple identities. Is the most important thing about you that, that you're black? What about all the other things that make you uniquely the person that you are, that make you, in your case, Charlotte Alter? You know, your love of journalism, your love of words, your love of narrative, your love of media, your love of film. I think that being black is important. But if you want to know why I am like I am, you go to Piedmont, West Virginia, and you'll say, ah, now I know. That mountain culture, Right. the motto of West Virginia is mountaineers are always free. Growing up fishing and hunting and growing up in that environment shaped who I am. So I want to get back to this idea of the black box because it's your latest book and it gets into some of these broader questions that I think our society and our nation is debating right now, particularly when it comes to affirmative action. And obviously the Supreme Court just ruled to end affirmative action. So how do you balance those two things? Like, how do you think about the black box in the context of affirmative action, which literally involves checking a box saying that you are black? The class of 66 at Yale had six black guys to graduate. The class that entered New Haven hit Yale's campus in September 69, right? A year after MLK was killed, had 96 black hits. Wow. And that's the year Yale went co ed. Now, without affirmative action, I wouldn't have gotten in. Hmm. Now, I think that I'm a pretty smart guy and I always got straight A's. But 
if you look at the class background of the six black guys who graduated from Yale, their fathers were doctors and lawyers. They were well connected. Okay. It wouldn't ever made it down to me hmm. in Piedmont, West Virginia. So I feel that I would be a hypocrite if I, through affirmative action, get into these institutions of privilege and power and status and then become a gatekeeper. No matter how small my gate, I'm definitely a gatekeeper. If I stood at that gate and tried to keep other people out, that would make me a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. So these schools disproportionately affect who is going to be in what C. Wright Mills called the power elite. And I want the power elite to look more or less in terms of percentages like the United States, right. like the federal census. I want 12% to be black. And I want whatever percent to be Latino and whatever percent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That might be naive and might be simplistic, but that's what my goal is. At least till we get to the point, which we haven't reached yet, when we can abolish all of these categories. But I think that taking account of the economic status of applicants so that we're, we're changing the class structure among the power elite, it's just as important as ethnic or religious representation. Hmm. And there's not a neat way to do this, you know, an easy formula so that you add up all these percentages and it comes out 100%. But I'm asked all the time about reparations. And I was asked yesterday in an interview about reparations. To me, affirmative action was a form of reparations. If you look at those 96 kids, who was in my class? Ben Carson. Ben Carson was in your class? Ben Carson was in my class. Wow. Kurt Schmoke, a college president, who was the first black mayor of Baltimore. Anthony Davis, professor at UCSD, who got the Pulitzer Prize for music in the year 2020. I could go on all day long. Right. But I think that we need to diversify the elite classes as consciously as we can without sacrificing standards. Do you think we're in a backlash moment right now? I'm thinking of particularly the sort of backlash against diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, the sort of push to try to take certain books out of schools that teach kids about racism or teach kids about Black history. Yes. I think that we are in an era of backlash, but it's a backlash generated by fear. Hmm. The working class people with whom I grew up thought that, uh, uh, well, to paraphrase Martin Luther King, who was paraphrasing someone else, that the, the arc of the economic universe was long and bent up, right. <laughs> bent positively. And nobody believes that anymore. And in my town, the paper mill that provided everybody virtually with a good life is not only gone, Someone sent me literally three days ago a photograph, and it was the mill. The physical plant had just been destroyed. Wow. And you know, it made me very, very sad. And it symbolized concretely what had happened economically, materially, spiritually to my wonderful little hometown. So when you feel that the rug has been pulled out from under you, that all of the certainties that you were raised with are gone. And you look around and you see there are all these Latino migrants and all these black people. You know, you can't watch a commercial on TV without seeing an interracial couple. And then regular people say, what the hell is that about? <laughs> so what happened to good old white America, you know? So people lash out because they're afraid. And you can't assuage someone's fears by bullying them. Hmm. You know, you have to speak to their fears. So under those conditions, two kinds of leaders arise. Those like Barack Obama and like Joe Biden, who are very sensitive and speak to fears. And those who exacerbate fears, like Donald Trump. Right. And I'm not trying to be partisan here. It's just a fact. And I think that Donald Trump's popularity is dependent upon exacerbating those fears mm. and saying, if you elect me, I'm going to get rid of all these immigrants. I'm going to build this big wall. I'm going to take all these bad books out of these schools. And I'm going to make life like it was in the 50s when you were watching Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver. And a real leader would say, ladies and gentlemen, 
I love that world. That world produced me, but that world is gone. Professor Gates, thank you so much for being here. I can truly say, as one of your former students, it's been such an honor talking to you about finding your roots, about your own genealogical history, and your new book, The Black Box, Writing the Race. But now, I want to ask you some questions about your everyday life in a segment we like to call The Last Time. So, when is the last time you spoke to your granddaughter, Ellie? Uh, Two weeks ago. How old is she now? Uh, nine. And I, I see her by every, every other week. Um, we have a third floor. Oh, nice. Above ground. Mm-hmm. And there's a room that was going to be my billiard room because I love to shoot pool. And I, for years, have fantasized about having my own pool table and billiard room. And you know what, Charlotte? It was colonized by that little girl. And it is now Ellie's room. And it's full of princess so and so's. Uh, pink tables and pink castles and all kind of uh, Barbies. And <laughs> wow, R.I.P. your billiards room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I lost that battle. So when's the last time you saw a movie in the movie theater? Oh, Oppenheimer. Okay. When is the last time you sat down in your kitchen to write? Oh, today. I, I do every day. Every single day. I'm at my kitchen table. It drives my wife crazy. (laughs) You know, I have a beautiful study on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And she has a beautiful study. And it's like a museum because I'm like a sunflower, um, heliotropic. And this is the the place that's most flooded with light Mm -hmm. in our home. And that's where I go. Every day. Wow. When is the last time you gave a student advice? Today. And last of all, I understand your wife is also a historian. When's the last mm-hmm. time you and your wife argued about a moment in history? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Like what are some of the arguments? I'm trying to think about what we argued about yesterday. She's a Cuban citizen, and um, she is always comparing the rise of fascism in um, post-war Soviet Union with what we're experiencing in this country today. And so I'm always pushing back. And the other thing that we disagree about is that she grew up in a communist country and her parents were very radical left. Mm -hmm. They thought Fidel Castro was radical enough. (laughs) (laughs) And so she interprets everything with an economic analysis first and foremost. And I, probably like you, because we're Americans, tend to think of, race, religion, ethnicity first, with economics trailing behind. Our leading propositions are are different. And it makes for fun. I love arguing with her. Yeah. Um, I learn a lot. She's tough. She's stubborn. You know, that makes for a great dinner party, you know, with just the two of us. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Well, it's such a joy to talk to you again. I I really appreciate it so much. Um, I hope we can keep in touch. I hope this won't be the last time we chat. Anytime. And, um, Keep watching Finding Your Roots. <laughs> I, I will. I will. You can find Gates's new book, The Black Box, Writing the Race, wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love to hear from you. So send your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and Allison Bailey. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Rebecca Seidel. Our theme music was composed by Billy Lippy. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Sugar 23. At Time, our executive producers are Dave O'Connor, Michael Erlinger, and Sam Jacobs. At Sugar 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash personoftheweek and wherever you get your podcasts.